Good evening, and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird, and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be on Wednesday, February 22nd, when, I'll, when I will be interviewing Jack Farrell about his new one-volume biography of Ted Kennedy. That event will take place in the Elabash Hall downstairs and will also be seen on Zoom. Please mark your calendars and register for this and our other events on the Leon Levy website. And if you have not done so already, please register your email address with us. But tonight I am delighted to introduce David Nassau, who will be in conversation with Hilary Hallett about her biography, Inventing the It Girl, How Eleanor Glynn Created the Modern Romance and Conquered Early Hollywood. Hilary Hallett is the Mendelssohn Family Professor and Director of American Studies and the Associate Professor of History at Columbia University. The author of Go West, Young Women, The Rise of Early Hollywood. She has written for the Los Angeles Times and elsewhere. David Nassau is the Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. Professor of History Emeritus. He retired last year? Two years, years ago, Two just years before ago. COVID. Just before COVID, right. Um, <clears throat> and he's a past president of the Society of American Historians. His most recent book is The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War. He's also the author of The Patriarch, The Remarkable Life and Turbulent Times of jo Joseph P. Kennedy, uh, which was a New York Times 10 Best Books of the Year and a Pulitzer Prize finalist in biography. His bestseller, Andrew Carnegie, was also a Pulitzer Prize finalist and the winner of the New York Historical Society's American History Book Prize. The Chief, The Life of William Randolph Hearst, was honored with several awards, including the Bancroft Prize for History. Please look for all these books online at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. David and Hillary will now be in conversation for about 45 minutes and then we'll take questions from both you and our virtual audience. For those uh, who are virtually here, please click on the question box at the bottom of your screens to type in your questions. And our deputy director, Thad Silkowski, will be monitoring the box and he will try to get to as many questions as he can. At the end of the evening, Hillary will be signing books over there. And again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. On that note, I turn the conversation over to David Nassau. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I've written a, three biographies of big, bad, larger than life, personalities, moguls. But let me tell you, <laughs> none of them had lives anywhere nearly as interesting as, God, multivariant, is that a word? As glamorous as Eleanor Glynn. Uh, and thank God, Hillary, a terrific historian, and a great writer decided to, to write this book. Um, and she gets it. It in capital IT, that's a pun. Um, we got it. <laughs> well, you and I get it, I don't know what it is. Get the book and you'll see why it's a, Okay, let's begin at the beginning. Um, when did you first meet her? Nell. Uh, see, I can't believe you don't remember that. I thought you would remember. So I met Eleanor Glynn writing my dissertation. Right. And I met her because I, so my first book was, you know, about the role of women 
in really the creation of Hollywood, the sexual politics that were involved in that industry's birth. And I was looking at Gloria Swanson, I was at the Harry Ransom archive, yeah. right, in um, Austin. And she made it really clear that this woman that I'd never heard of was the person that sculpted her into the first glamour queen. So I went to the secondary literature, there was like nothing on her, they made fun of her, what little there was. But then she kept coming up, like, you know, Cecil B. DeMille and Samuel Goldwyn and Charlie Chaplin, and everybody talked about this woman and how important she was. Um, and so she ended up running away with a chapter in my dissertation. And you said to me, reading an early draft, she's fascinating, but this is too much. Save it for a biography later, yes. maybe. No. Yes, you really? did. I swear to God. Thank God. <laughs> you did. And so I did. So you took it, it she came out of the... So, no, she stays, she's a, she's a, a big figure yeah. in one of the chapters, but, you know, there was so, I, what, what you could tell, yeah. you know, was that there was so much more to her story than I could fit into, you know, the Hollywood piece of her life, which is the third act of her life. You know, it's, as you said, she has this, she's brought there as a celebrity. So, you know, I couldn't fit all that in, in the Hollywood book. And so I needed to have a book just about her. But did you, um, you knew where all the sources were? No, so then what happened was that I went to England and my husband is a British historian, so we spent a summer in Oxford because her archive is at Reading. But of a different century. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chris does different centuries. <laughs> yes, a British historian of the 18th century Atlantic world empire, not at all this world. Um, and I, for, it should be said, knew nothing about this world and I'm a Midwesterner and honestly did not even have any interest in the aristocracy. And so one of the things that was a question in my mind, right, was did I think I would be able to write sympathetically and empathetically about these people that I found off putting? Um, but I also wanted to find out if, from what I could tell online, the archive at Reading had been vacuumed, all of her personal correspondence, diaries, which I knew she wrote thousands of letters and kept diaries her whole life, none of that was in that archive. It was purely professional. It had been set up by her daughter, who was an economist. Um, but, so then I started writing to all of her family members because she had two daughters that married well and had children. And so I was writing to grandchildren and great-grandchildren and finally somebody wrote me two weeks before we were supposed to leave and said, I think I have the letters that you're looking for, you know, safely in a trunk in Wales. And if you can come to London, I'll have them, I'll have the trunk bought to London, wow. you know. And so that was where I got access to all the, per, the, the material that allowed me to bring her inner life to life. When did you, you said you don't like aristocrats, and you know, I, I get it. And the English are probably the worst of all of them. But did you ever, or I guess when, did you ever begin to like her? And you know, if so, when? Or is that a stupid question? Yeah, I decided that was a stupid question, I'm sorry. I yeah. did worry about it in the beginning. And honestly, her great-granddaughter asked me that question. So she left me in this beautiful apartment, you know, in a ritzy part of London, to photograph these letters. And she came back at the end of the day and was like, what if you don't like her? You know, and I wish again I could imitate the accent, said in that imperious way. And I was like, you know, because honestly, I was afraid I wasn't going to like her. Yeah. And I was a little bit afraid of spending a whole lot of time with someone I didn't like. Yeah. But then I decided that wasn't the right question. Like no. you just said, you write biographies of bad guys, right? Yeah. You know, part of what stops women from, I think, you know, exercising power sometimes in the way that men can is that they are worried about being liked too much. The What's extraordinary about her is that when, when we use the word self-made as an adjective, it's almost always in reference to men. And yet, if there was ever a character, a person who was self-made, self-manufactured, I mean, this is her, from, from when? From, Earliest. 
I mean, I do give a little credit. Like, she has this sister who's also really remarkable, right? Who's a year older than her, who becomes the most celebrated couturier of the Edwardian period, survives the sinking of the Titanic, and is vilified for it. Um, and the two of them have very different temperaments, but they're both obviously very imaginative, creative, bright little girls whose sort of mutual ambitions support each other. And without Lucy's, they don't, you know, they're middle class, they have a stepfather that keeps them short of money, but because of this sister, Eleanor always looks gorgeous and like she has way more money than she has, right? And so her sister, you know, having that sister is a piece of it, you know, because being able to appear like something you're not exactly, she learns very early in life is an important skill, you know? Um, She's, um, was, was it hard to s focus on Nell yeah. rather than write a biography of both of them? I mean, if I could have found the same kinds of materials about Lucy Duff Gordon, um, I probably, I might have tried to do both of them, but I couldn't. She only has a professional archive at the V&A, yeah. Victoria and Albert. Um, but it was hard, like as you said, this is a woman who knows some of the most, you know, interesting, powerful, creative personalities in Britain, you know, the, you know early Hollywood, in, Paris. Yep. India, India, Egypt. Cairo, St. Petersburg, you know, she's, you know, visiting the Romanovs right before the Russian Revolution. I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, and writing about that setting in a way that makes everybody understand why the revolution is going to come, right? The decadence of it all. Um, yeah, so it was hard not to let the people and places that she knew sometimes carry away the narrative too much. The... Um I guess last week, um, Kai interviewed Beverly Gage, who just wrote a biography of uh, J. Edgar Hoover. And someone in the audience asked the question, said, you introduce yourself to Beverly as a historian. You don't call yourself a biographer. You say you're a historian. Um, what does that add? And does it detract from the work? How does it influence the writing, the research in the writing? Of biography? Of this book in particular? Well, I mean, I think one thing, you know, I, you know, just like sometimes the people and places that she knew uh, could sometimes carry away the narrative. The context, I think, if you're an historian, is as important as the subject. And so you're always looking, I am anyway, for the dynamic between the two, right? How one is affect, you know, that sort of interplay between the two. And I think if you're maybe, if you don't get a PhD in history and have that sort of training, you might in some ways, like, sometimes I wondered if it took away from the pure biography, right? I think for some readers it might, um, but it's important to me, and it's just I, you know that that. So I think that's what it adds. It adds a complexity to the um, larger historical currents and forces at work, and the subject's connection to them and how they're influencing each other. If that yeah. makes sense. Um, you don't have to have a PhD to be a, a great historian. Um, no. I think, and I often wonder what it might. My wife worked for the New York Times for a long time, and at one point there was some discussion about the editorial board. And she said, being a reporter at the New York Times has taken all my opinions away from me. I can't come to the you know, editorial board. And I sometimes wonder if the training we undergo as PhD historians is not something that, that you have to resist at the same time as you embrace it. Mm -hmm. um, and this book, as history and as biography, uh, I mean, works from beginning to end. You make a very powerful statement 
in your introduction. And it becomes clear that you're not only a historian, but you're writing as a historian who takes very seriously the history of women and gender. Um, and you sort of, well, you don't sort of, you nail lots of historians of mass culture and of Hollywood by saying that they write about the boys. They don't write about the women. Mm -hmm. And you make it clear that that leaves out a whole lot. Can you talk about that and talk about your first book too? Yeah. I mean, this has been a, you know, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's sort of my little cause, I guess, is trying to expose people to the, the reality that um, mass culture was not man-made, right? That women were, you know, very influential in shaping both popular literature, uh, you know, which was obviously Eleanor Glenn's first, you know, metier, um, journalism, you know, which she also did a lot of, and then finally, you know, early Hollywood itself. Um, you know, the number of women that were directing, writing, producing uh, in the teens and early 20s has still not been equal today. And so obviously white women we're talking about exclusively here, although some of them are ethnically a little more mixed than that, but largely white women. Um, but yet, you know, it's, it's so, it's, it's kind of, and, and they're also, the other dimension of this, right, is that the audience member they have in mind is quite often female too. You know, there aren't a lot of good statistics that are really reliable, but the ones that Hollywood hears in its very earliest years um, suggests that, you know, 75 to 85 percent of the seats are occupied by females. And this was in part like a deliberate design by producers to kind of make movies more respectable, right? Get more women into the audience, and it worked spectacularly well. Um, and so by the early 20s, you really have an industry that is not, uh, especially in writing, women are incredibly common, right? Most of the, the first two Oscars are by a woman named Frances Marion that you know very well. It's not just Glenn, right? There are a lot of powerful women working in this industry. Um, and they're writing, you know, in many respects to please the kind of fantasies and and desires of female audience members. And so it's a different origin story to think about mass culture this way um, and not just think about it as something that was, you know, as we sort of think about some of the early mass culture theories that are developing in the post-war period, you know, is a very different gender political landscape than the period we're talking about, right? There was actually a great, much more sort of, um, energy around feminism and the new woman, et cetera, right, in the early 20th century than there was, you know, after World War II, obviously. And so a lot of the early ideas that became popular about mass culture are about that 1950s period, and they obliterate this earlier landscape, right, that had a very different workforce, a different idea of its audience, right, um, and often, you know, work, you know, like romance-driven uh, stories were the single most popular genre, right? So the, the um, you know I'm I'm reading I'm writing a book about veterans returning from World War II. Um, it's the other side of the tom. It's the wounded generation, and I'm reading all this noir novels, um, and until I started reading them, I had always assumed that you know these are guys who are writing them. And I came across Dorothy Hughes, mm -hmm. who is, has anybody read Dorothy Hughes? Yeah, I'm. She is extraordinary. I think I'm introducing one of her films in a couple of weeks. There's a film noir festival in two weeks at Columbia, the Kit Noir Film Festival. It's on women in noir this year. Oh, great. Yeah, it's going to be great. And Shelley Stamp, uh, you know, is going to be talking. She's, her current book is on women in noir her research anyway, she doesn't have a book yet. But, um, and I'm introducing a couple of films and I think one of them is Karen Hughes. Yeah, <laughs> In a Lonely Place. In a Lonely Place. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. suppose. When, what, but what happens? I mean, Ellen, well, I'm jumping out of chronology, which a historian yeah, should I never do. I did that. Um, <laughs> but in 1928, mm -hmm. Eleanor leaves Hollywood. 
she goes to London to produce, and tries to produce films there. What happens between 1928 and Ida Lupino? Are there still women through the 30s and the 40s and the 50s? Well, I mean, so they hang on longest in screenwriting. Um, but after Fallberg dies in 1936, uh, he was considered to be one of the last real supporters of female screenwriters at MGM. Um, you know, the phasing out of directors and producers happens really, you know, a little bit earlier than that. I mean, if you're asking why, why does that happen? Why does it change so much? I mean, partially because Hollywood, you know, it's, it's difficult to sort of convey how quickly that industry sort of ballooned into this thing, this magic bubble, you know, right after World War I. And nobody knew, right, what it was going to be. That was partially why women got so much power. As it, you know, becomes clear, as it becomes the fourth largest industry in the United States by the early 20s, and it, you know, starts to capitalize on Wall Street, part of what happens is it takes on the mores of corporate America rather than the theater, which is where most of the first workforce came from. Um, and, you know, big businesses aren't, they don't put women in charge of things, mm -hmm. right? And unions don't allow women members still mostly, right? So as the unions come in, like there's good things we know about that, but one of the bad things is they don't allow non-white members and they don't allow female workers, right? And so, you know, it's, an in, it's in different industries, like women's exodus happens a little differently, um, but there's like literally one woman, Dorothy Arzner, directing by the 40s, and she's always talked about as if she were the first and only woman director, when in fact she was the last, right? She was mentored by another woman named Lois Weber, um, and then there are basically none <laughs> for decades. Let's go back in, after my jumping to 1928. Um, I was one of the things that struck me when I read the book again was the ways in which Eleanor is a creature of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's, her childhood is in Canada, right? And Jersey, but yeah. Jersey, Canada, then Jersey. Jersey Island. Right. In the Channel Islands, yeah. Right. <laughs> Not it's New a, Jersey. It's another Jersey, <laughs> right. right. Canada, Jersey, Scotland? No, really Canada and Jersey. Canada, I'm sorry. But Canada. she also, you know, Jersey is very close to France. It's closer to fr France than England. And then she spends time in And how so she spends in time in, you know, she spends formative parts of her adolescence in, 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 with her French relations in Paris. And how long does she spend in Cairo? She spends... She doesn't spend that long in Cairo. I mean, she spends like, like, like that class. That's a bit later, right? Once yeah. she marries up. I mean, she does what the members of the leisure class do. They make these, you know, winter sojourns. And Cairo by 1900 is a stop for British society folks. Um, but I do think, you know, what you're touching on, I think part of the key to her success was that her national identity was lightly rooted. I really do. I mean, that was something. I think she grew up somewhat, you know, yes, a true cosmopolitan. She grew up fluent in English and French. And, you know, really didn't, I don't, I mean, this is, I write about this. I write about, I mean, I think she, she was confused about her national identity at different points. I think as she grew older, she did come to associate more with Britain, primarily because of wars. Um, you know, and just the, the way that that all works out. But yeah, I think that she was able to take different elements from different cultures and sort of fashion them also into, you know, this kind of package that was so appealing. I think that was also part of the key to her success. She's, when does she realize or does she realize that she's not an ugly duckling, that she's beautiful or glamorous or a sex symbol, when does that happen? Well, I think those are different things. Yes. Yeah, I mean, one at a time. yeah, I think she realizes she's beautiful in France. And I think that explains in part partially why she did have such an attachment to French culture because, you know, she, she had this very bright red hair 
you know, and very white skin and green eyes. And red hair had, you know, historically very negative associations. Um, and so as a child, that made her an ugly duckling because of her unusual, beautiful coloring. Um, but as she, in France, partially because she was so well turned out and so elegant because of the sister, and, you know, they just appreciated, you know, that look more, and that gave her a confidence, I think, that then allowed her to eventually kind of conquer British society, too, which wasn't as stylish, as we all know, as the French, right, um, in terms of, you know, fashion, but, you know, and I think it was the French, too, that really set her kind of sexual ideals, you know, and sort of idea of sensuality, right? It's Sarah Bernhardt, it's seeing this um, famous performance of Sarah Bernhardt as the Byzantine Empress Theodora <laughs> in the 1880s at 16, right? That gives her, you know, no one knows she understands French fluently, so she's brought to see a play that a 16-year-old girl shouldn't be seeing. Um, and of course she does know French fluently and she talks you know, in her diary about going home and pretending to be Sarah Bernhardt and whispering the love words right, of this kind of tigerish passion as she describes it that was new to her. And she's 16? And she's 16. So I guess, yeah, I think it, it is a very, but I think it's also, I was saying this just the other night to Alice because I mean it's also you know, her, sexu her idea of sexuality is, is definitely also shaped by literature. By literature, by the historical lives of courtesans, which she was fascinated with, by um, French pornography, which Cecil Beaton says she was fascinated with. You know, so, she, you know, she's a writer. She spends a lot of time reading and writing. Um, and I think that, you know, the idea of the Greeks and their idea of sexuality fascinated her, I know. So it's not just the French. I mean, it, again, it's a pastiche, yeah. you know. She's, um, before we talk about the novels, I, I want you to talk about her, her marriage and, and she marries at a late, comparatively late age. And she's in control, no? I mean, she chooses her partner, mm. no? Mm. <laughs> mm. No, I mean, she was 28, and she had no diary, dowry. Her sister was about to get divorced, which yeah. was, you know, not something people were doing in the 1880s. You know, the family had very, the stepfather by that point had died. There was a tiny inheritance. She was under a great deal of pressure to marry, at a, and she had reached an age where you were really pretty much a spinster. So, I mean, did she end up picking somebody that sort of met her wish list, more or less? Yes. But, mm, you know, like, would she have necessarily picked him if she didn't have to get married? I don't think so. No, but. One of the things I, that I don't understand is these two extraordinary women mm -hmm. both pick horrible guys. Yeah. Well, I think. And, and is it because they don't have a dowry? Mostly. Because their choices aren't that great? The dowry was that important? The dowry was still that important if you wanted to marry in that class, right? I mean, they didn't want to marry middle class people, they wanted to marry up. And if you wanted to marry up, usually, yes, it was still, even though, you know, that was one of the tensions that she had to deal with. She was a person shaped by paradox, you know? And so on the one hand, this middle-class upbringing does have some commitment to the idea of romantic love, right? Uh, but on the other hand, all the messages that girls were still given about marriage being really, you know, a, a, picking a partner that would provide stability, financial, you know, uh, upward financial mobility. And so, I mean, as I say, like that was part of why I found her interesting. She was really bred to be only one thing, a wife, you know, and if she was lucky to marry up as a wife. And yet, as you say, she's still able to, you know, have this completely self-made incredible life. But, but yeah, she had to marry by that point. 
And um, why did Lucy marry Duff Gordon? Because... Did everybody know Duff Gordon? Yeah, well, that was her second husband. He was a good husband. Yeah, he, her, she married better her second time. <laughs> the older sister. Um, the first time, she was very young, and she was just trying to escape the stepfather, who they both hated. Right, and she married a much older man, who seemed, I think, I mean, they, you know, it was, I mean, I think it, she was also jilted and, you know, on the rebound. Um, but Duff Gordon, her second husband, really helped finance her business yeah. and helped manage it. So he was a very supportive spouse. The, um, the novels, I mean, her first breakthrough career in which she achieves fame and fortune and infamy, I guess, mm -hmm. um, is as a novelist. Um, she's not, you know, George Eliot or Proust. No. Um, but then again, her, her biggest novel, I mean, her um, sells, I blocked on the name. Three uh, weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. You say sells two million copies in its first decade, and then another five million when it comes out in a, in a cheaper edition. Mm -hmm. And the, the book is just scandalous. Did she know what she was doing? And, and how'd she get away with it? First, describe the book for yeah. us. So this book was sort of a Fifty Shades of Grey of its day. It's just what I tell people, right? <laughs> just to give you an idea. Um, and it's her sixth novel. So she's already well known at this point as society's like main chronicler. But she's, you know, managed to kind of walk the line and sort of hint at things in a way that's very decorous. Uh, and she hasn't really gotten into too much trouble. And then she publishes this book, Three Weeks, um, for which she is ostracized from British society, um, which her closest friend, who was a very eminent hostess of the era, told her, don't publish the book or you'll be ostracized from British society. And so, you know, the question is, you know, she claims you know, to her dying day, basically, that she didn't know, she, that she was shocked by the stupendous, stupendous hypocrisy. Well, tell us what happens okay, during right, those sorry. three weeks. Yes, <laughs> so the three weeks is about an older, it's not, you know, an, an uncommon idea, especially in European literature, right, of an older, more ex sexually experienced, exotic foreign woman who literally only goes by the name of Lady, for most of the book, and she's traveling, she's in Switzerland, you know, in some fancy hotel, and she espies a handsome young man across the dining room and decides immediately that that is gonna be the man that she seduces and teaches to be the perfect lover that she has never had. And she's got three weeks to do this. That's why it's called Three Weeks. <laughs> and so that's what the story's about, almost all of it. Two thirds of the book is about this three week affair between the lady, as she's called, and Paul, the young English aristocrat. Um, that, and, and it's a very long seduction, right? It's a very, very long seduction until she orchestrates what she calls their wedding night. Uh, and it's, you know, they, they, it's, there's a lot of sexual tension, sexual frustration that's built up over lots of teasing and role playing and, you know, it, it, as I said, it goes on night after night. Um, and then finally, you know, they have their wedding night, which is obviously very important to Paul, but doesn't actually seem that important to the lady. Uh, and then he wakes up the next day and she's gone, <laughs> of course. And <laughs> she finds out that he... He finds out, rather, that she was a Slavic queen who was married to a, you know, crazy king and had never been happy and so, you know, was taking this trip, you know, and um, that, in, you know, she had left to protect him because she knew eventually her husband's henchmen would find her. And so she's taken back to the kingdom, killed by her husband after she gives birth to Paul's love child then her servants kill him, <laughs> right? It's a romance. But <laughs> so did she, the question is, did she know that this was gonna get her in trouble? Of course she did. Yeah. And she couldn't really admit that, but 
she, if you look at the introduction to the American edition, which is published you know, four or five months after the British edition, there's an introduction that literally says, like, you know, if you're going to read any more of this bad book, here's what you have to do. And so she's, she's admitting, right, that it's a, she knows that it's different. It's a bad book that's somehow much naughtier than all of her other books. And I mean, I think she does this in part because at this point she has realized that her husband is completely out of money. And so the sort of fiction that, you know, the Glen estate was supporting their very lavish lifestyle completely collapses. And, you know, I think she does it also because she turned to writing. You know, one of the things I liked about her story, right, is, as David says, like she marries, she seems to marry up in the nick of time, but then she's trapped in this very miserable marriage. It's a total misalliance. She becomes depressed, has a couple kids, becomes more depressed. And she really turns to writing as an antidote to depression, right? And it works. And so I think she kind of knows that this book, by this point, is going to potentially make her famous. You know, I think she's willing to gamble on that. Um, also, as I say, though, at this moment, because financial necessity is, is really starting to play But she doesn't there. get entirely thrown out of no. British aristocracy. Mostly. I mean, no. I mean, she has a few well, loyal part friends. Part of the royal family. No, no. He won't allow the book to be mentioned. King, uh, you know, Prince Edward, who becomes King Edward right around the time of the publication of the book. Yeah. And is, you know, a man who obviously a serial philanderer does all of this. <laughs> this is why she couldn't believe it, right? Like has a million mistresses. <laughs> you know, and no, 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 it's, I mean, her closest friends stick by her, yes. And this is also, this book becomes the calling card to her introduction to um, George Curzon, you know, the Marquess of Kettleston and Viceroy of India, who is, yes, an aristocrat. <laughs> uh, and they begin this, this is, this is the love of her life, I guess you could call him, and they begin a 10-year affair shortly after the publication of this book. She's much more successful in her liaisons than she is in her she marriage. Is. She is. Although, honestly, this is another paradox, I think, about Eleanor Glenn, is that she makes a new genre almost, right, by reorienting you know, the romance genre towards the subject of sex and sexual desire and the role that it plays in love and a happy relationship. And yet, she never really has a successful relationship with a man. Not with Curzon? I mean, it's, that's, I mean, she, you know, I mean, he keeps her at arm's length. I mean, right. she is married for most of their life. But as soon as the, he's free and she's free, he marries someone else yeah. and dumps her. Yeah. Uh, what? OK. I'm giving now away too at, much. No. <laughs> Who brings her to Hollywood? Jesse Lasky, Paramount Pictures. And does he know what he's getting? Um, I, I think, you know, based on the reactions, you know, his memoir, I think he was, I think everyone was a little, I mean, y y surprised by the extent of her uh, command, you know, and, and the way that she just sort of, uh, the confidence and sort of, you know, willingness to sort of jump into this industry about which she knew nothing. And how old is she? She's, She's 56. 56. So this is why I say it's her third act. Um, yeah. And she's literally, as I, I did the birthdays once, she and Hearst were literally the two oldest people in that set. You know what I mean? By a lot. They both were 10, 20 years older, uh, 30 years older in some cases, right, than many of the other people. Yeah, but does she, she, but she doesn't arrive as a grandmother. I mean, she no, arrives, no. right, no. as the... Grand dame. Yeah. Yes. I mean, she, so she calls herself, you know, for this in third act, um, she starts to insist that everyone call her in, in a professional capacity, at least, Madame Glynn, right? <laughs> she's coming from Paris, where she's been living, you know, reporting on World War I for the last four years. And so she's, she, she has real reason to claim the French credentials in a way, yeah. but it's bizarre, right, to people that suddenly she's insisting that, that she be called Madame Glynn. And she, you know, 
she is able to convince everyone, because it's true, that she knows more about real style and glamour, which Hollywood is obviously trying to convey on screens now as they become the world's leader, leading producer of movies. But they don't, most of them haven't really been anywhere. Most of them are young and they, you know, have worked really hard at one thing and become really rich and famous really quickly, but they don't have a lot of experience of the world. But there's an extraordinary transformation from Mary Pickford. Yes, to Gloria Swanson. To Gloria Swanson and Clara Bow. I mean, it's, yeah. it's revolutionary. Yeah. And she's right in the middle of that. Yeah. Would it have happened without her? You well, can't tell. You can't tell. I mean, I, Gloria Swanson didn't think she could have been Gloria Swanson without her, you know? I mean, Cecil D B. DeMille says she deserves more credit for inventing sex appeal than I do. You know, I mean, most early, this is, this is how I found her, was all these early Hollywood people talking about how, because part of what makes her so important you know, and if you, you know, like I said, she has this very upper class British accent. So she can also play the lady and she's so elegant. And, you know, she's able to teach people how to use finesse and style and glamor to convey more explicit depictions of romantic passion and sex on screens than had been previously permissible but often in a way that doesn't get them into too much trouble, right, with the censors and the moralists, because she does have this very, you know, elegant uh, British lady side. But how, how does she, I mean, and again, this is a remarkable part of this book. I mean, she plays with the big boys. Yeah. She's not, you know, off somewhere making little movies. Yeah. She's with all of the Hollywood moguls. Thalberg and King Veter and you know Jesse Lasky and yeah, all of them Paramount and MGM. She's I mean her films are some her, of the and, and she, she Yeah, but holds see, her remember own. she's coming by that point. One of the things that surprised me the most at writing the book about learning I learned about her was how important actually those World War I years were, I think. I don't know without the experience uh, that she went through in World War I if she would have had quite the same confidence. Right. Or they also democratized her, right? Because she spends World War, the last few years um, of the war in Paris, and she's giving lectures to thousands of soldiers, right? Trying to, you know, tell them, you know, I forget what she's saying. She's visiting hospitals and she's going to the front and she's writing these articles trying to get Americans involved in the war effort and support the war effort because she's such a popular novelist, right, in America. And that's what, what the only women really that got to go to the front were popular novelists to write about it, to like enlist support. And she's hanging out with, you know, the prime minister by the end when the Treaty of Versailles is being signed, right? She's hanging out with, you know, the prime minister of Britain and, Kurt, you know, she knows all the leading politicians. She's taught, I just think she, she became confident that she could literally talk to anybody yeah. through the experience of those couple but of years. But she gets into trouble with her, her business. Yeah, she's feeling. a terrible business. She's woman. terrible and she doesn't choose the right advisors. No. Yeah. And by 19, is it 1928? Yeah. She. Well, she has a lot of money. She makes her own, she produces her own movies. But you said that she loses it when she goes back to London. Because she produces her own movies. I mean, she pays for them. She paid for her own movies. And that the last. And they don't do well. Obviously. No. And, and the last, <laughs> the epilogue. Yeah. We won't say it's act four, because it's not. The epilogue is sort of sad. Mm. No? Maybe. <laughs> well, she loses, she loses her money. She's not poor. Well, she becomes, she, I don't think that she, I mean, so you think it was sad because she? Yeah. You don't? I mean. She's a mother. She, she loves her daughters, but mm -hmm. there's even trouble there. Yes. Yes. And she, and what about Lucy? They, they were, yes. there's trouble there. There is trouble there, but I don't, <laughs> I mean, okay. And she has a dreadful, painful facelift. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when she was does. that? 
<laughs> this is an extraordinary. She had to lie with her jaw wired for a Stop week. Stop from or like something. scratching at the healing. Yeah, it's not good. Um, yeah, I mean, old age is hard, right? Um, I guess I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's a stiff upper lip thing that she was able to do, but my sense of her in her last years, right? She had a bevy of admirers, of younger mm -hmm. admirers, right? All the younger generation loved her, right? The, the new romantic novelist loved her. Cecil Beaton, as I mentioned, loved her. All the, the sort of brilliant young things of the 1930s, you know, she was like partially a figure of camp to them, but also they took her very seriously and they, you know, took her to lunch and, she had enough money to live in a beautiful little apartment in Mayfair with her cats, which is all she ever wanted. She it's preferred, a great picture of her, yeah, her cats you know, at the end. She loved hotel rooms. What she were her cats? The name? Candide and Voltaire. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? OK, I think on that, we should pause and see if there are any questions. Um, should we start in the room, or, or you've got a question? Are there, anybody have a question? Yes, please. Can you talk about your sources, how you were able to construct the life and the history? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the trunk was mostly full of journals and letters, letters to her mother, to her daughters, to various family members for the most part, not many letters to her, letters she had written that had clearly been saved on the other side. Um, and so that was a really important piece of the research. I also spent a lot of time in her archive in Reading, um, you know, which contains, especially for the Hollywood stuff, uh, you know, one whole chapter that was really, you know, to me, one of the saddest chapters uh, it, called Family Fortunes, which is about when her daughter and son-in-law come out to help her mm. and basically almost ruin her career. Um, you know, that all came out of the Reading Archive, right? Because all of the Hollywood stuff, the business part of that is, is um, in that archive and, you know, these letters, you know, between her son-in-law and Samuel Goldwyn, who, you know, she picks, he picks this giant fight with. Um, sorry, not Samuel Goldwyn, Louis B. Mayer. So it was a mixture, right, of business records, dealing with both her literary career and her Hollywood career. Um, you know, a lot of memoirs of the people that she knew and looking in their archives. The thing that's tricky is, you know, I think especially people from that class, on the one hand, incredibly generous to share some of the material that I was telling you about in the trunk. On the other hand, you know, like Curzon himself, that the lover that she had for 10 years, nothing. The only thing that survives about their relationship are references about him in her letters to her mother or sister, one journal, that was, you know, like this heartbreak journal, basically, that she kept over, you know, how much the relationship basically, like, tortured her. Um, but they had written thousands of letters to each other. Both of them burned them, Ay. right? I mean, people were very careful to get rid of things, too, I guess is what I'm saying. So, you know, and then a lot of journalism, uh, too. I spent a lot of time with newspapers, right? Um, partially because she was, a, you know, she did do a lot of um, journalism, at, you know, especially in those war years. It's, so I, I think one of the things I actually enjoyed about this project was it was a really varied kind of source body, you know. Um, a lot of sources to help me reconstruct the places that she went to that I haven't been. Right, and so say for instance, like I was working at the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library when I was writing a lot of it, and they have tons of historical maps. So you know, I could use those to help me figure out what Cairo looked like in 1900. You know, what the Sphinx looked like in 1900, because it obviously doesn't look anything like it does today. 
Um, so stuff like that. Because she was a very, uh, she, one of her big rules as a writer was don't write about places you haven't been. <laughs> so that made me, I, I haven't been to a lot of places that she has, and, but I felt kind of guilty about it. So I would spend a lot of time making sure that I could at least sort of viscerally imagine it a little bit. Right. Yeah. Do you, th do you think that uh, sh she thought there was a spine to her life, a logic to it, uh, hmm. that it made sense, it all built up one thing on the other? So interesting. And do you have uh, a logic to her life and her see a spine and her choices built to a specific point? And would these two narr narratives agree? Wow, that's a very good question. Very, very deep question. <laughs> um, I think, so one of the things that I, she was a spiritualist. I don't know if anybody here knows what that is. But it was actually pretty fashionable. A lot of people were sort of late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and what that meant was that she believed in, you know, past lives, reincarnation, um, you know, she did believe in karma. She called it her Hindu thinking. You know, so she was, a, you, know, it, you know, it's borrowing on Eastern elements of uh, religious ideas, obviously. So I think Eleanor, I mean, believed in her own, like this idea again of being self-made. She really believed she meditated almost every day of her life for an hour. And she focused that meditation on what she wanted. And it was a practice that she developed, you know, you know, in early middle age and she kept, you know, throughout, you know, her life. And so I think that she she also wrote in a journal early on that she would never be content to stay in one place or live an uneventful life. So I think that's the spine. Right, that she would never, she knew, I think because she did move a fair amount when she was little, she understood the sort of, for her anyway, that changing places, I think she had a tendency to be a little depressive and that changing places was an antidote to that. She figured that out pretty young and I think that she also, so that's like don't, don't allow yourself to be trapped in one place and the, you know, don't lead an uneventful life. And it actually reminds me of something you would say don't bore me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, I mean, she, and she didn't bore you. She didn't bore me. Not for that's a minute. for sure. Um, would I say that's the same spine that I had? I don't think it is the same spine that I had exactly. You know, um, I, I, I think. The closest I got, you know, to the spine of it, it's, it's not really going to be a very good answer, you know. But it, but it was this kind of, um, you know, I think the theater background in me, you know, three acts and sort of seeing, you know, the kind of three acts of her life unfolding. And that, that's what was the spine eventually for me. But that's sort of... I, I understand that. It's a little vague. <laughs> yes? Um, she, what was her relationship, oh, her relationship with, let's say, more literary writers who were her contemporary? Because I'm thinking about Edith Wharton, mm -hmm. thinking about Willa Cather, or Somerset Mom. Uh, you know, like. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, she had almost no relationship with literary people. Yeah. It's, the, it's a pretty easy one to answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she knew that they thought by the time, so, so she's, her reputation is actually okay until three weeks and then it's trash. I have a chapter called Trash, right? So, and she knew that that, that was how literary people thought of her. Um, she, you know, her company was more, you know, politicians, aristocrats, um, she has this great quote when she's in Los Angeles where she says, I really get along only with aristocrats from all countries and the low classes who work. They're almost as good as aristocrats. 
you know, and so she doesn't, she doesn't see her, she's, you know, she's, it's like anti her own middle class background in some ways, but she, she just, Somerset Maugham was actually in Los Angeles, he was another eminent author like her, who was brought to Los Angeles in 1920 to write for the movies. Most of these people don't stay like him for more than a few months, they hate it and flee, you know, and she obviously, she becomes literally the most famous writer in Hollywood in six months. So she wasn't, she wasn't, she didn't consider herself like part of the literary circle though. She considered herself more a part of an aristocratic circle or a kind of hard working circle, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does, it does. Yeah, and Virginia Woolf thought she was, you know, people, 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 <laughs> and I love Woolf as a writer, yeah. you know, but you know, people, she knew what people thought of her. Yeah. No, and it's funny that she, uh, all of those, the great women writers, none of them had kids. Right. But she did. She did. Yeah. She did. She had two daughters, one of whom, you know, became a self-taught economist and the governor of the BBC, you know, was clearly her daughter, like a ferociously smart person herself. Um, in a different way. Clearly, like, I mean, I think the money problems that you were mentioning, like, clearly this daughter was just like, both of her parents were spendthrifts, you know, terrible with money, made it, lost it, and her daughter was, you know, became an economist. <laughs> you know? Makes sense. I got one. You mentioned that uh, she was playing with the big boys as soon as she got to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. What about the big girls? How was she received amongst the girls' club, the writers? and Yeah, the, yeah, that's a great question. Birds. I mean, the actresses seemed to love her, right? I mean, she was a, not just, you know, she, one of these, one podcast I did, the woman was like, she was an early 20th century influencer. And it's true, right? Because it sounds trivial, but if you really take that, you know, to mean someone who helped these women and men, she was doing this for Rudolph Valentino, John <laughs> Gilbert, Right, she was teaching them how to dress, make love, talk, deal with the press, right, which was very, very important. Um, she was very good friends with Mary Pickford, you know, who was a very powerful, not just actress, obviously, but producer who started United, who started United Artists. You know, the writers, again, I think m she got on more with the producers like June Mathis and the actresses not, I, I don't, the writers were a little bit not quite as close, right? But certainly she and Pickford, who was one of the most powerful women in Hollywood, um, you know, in some ways Pickford was teaching her about the business and, you know, she was trying to help Mary Pickford figure out how to shift her image into what the 20s wanted, which she was struggling to do. She makes that cameo in It. Yes, yes, you've seen that, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> One last question back here. Uh, um, you mentioned early on about the respectability of the movies for a female audience, and I'm wondering, because she's obviously interested in ideas of respectability, or maybe she's not interested in, okay. She's interested in ideas of sexuality and romance, and I'm wondering how those three things influence her two different medium media as a writer and a movie, you know, books and movies. Mm -hmm. I had the question was much more articulate in my head. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I get you. I think. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting about her literary—I'll do the literary piece first. You know, she, as I said, she isn't respectable, but. Like, in a way that I think we need to give her credit, like, she's actually, we talk a lot about D.H. Lawrence pushing censorship codes and Anglo-American literary conventions. She's doing that before him, right? She is really, um, you know, her books are banned in all kinds of places and, you know, not sold in all kinds of places and not respectable. Um, but at the same time, because they're so commercially successful, and because in Anglo-America there's no pre-censorship of litership, literature, what, you, what she figures out is that a super, super commercially successful book can't be censored in the same way. And so it's, it is, and it's also probably slightly gendered, right? Because it's her and a couple of other new women writers in that period that also, they both get away with 
publishing things that maybe a man wouldn't. They get in trouble for it, but they still get the sales. It gets yeah. published, right? And so the sort of respectability of just being a female author helps a little bit, I think. Um, and in the same way, like in Hollywood, it's the respectability of being a British lady. You know, she figures out early on, too, in terms of her literary persona in three weeks. It's, she's brilliant at kind of concocting this paradoxical persona, which is both part British lady and part like exotic siren of her tiger queen heroine, right? And so it's by kind of constantly walking the edge of the two that she's able, you know, to get away with what she does, if, if that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank the audience. You've been great, great questions. <laughs> Hillary, you're terrific. Thank I mean, you, you, David. Thank talk you, as well as you write, <laughs> um, almost as well as you write. Mm. Um, that's a commercial for the book. It is an extraordinary <laughs> book. I urge you all to pick it up on your way out. I want to thank Kai, the Leon Levy Center, and Shelby White for making this all possible. And thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>